All right, so we're up. So a uh, Taiwanese gaming news website, gamer.com.tw, G-N-N, reported uh, Wargaming Asia publishing producer Hisashi Yaganuma talks about Wargaming's plans for a pan-Asian tech tree during public meeting. And then a source, I'll have that in the uh, comments area, but this is from Reddit. But just, uh, they mentioned the ROC, I think it's like Republic of China's Navy Tanyang, which was the Yukikaze, uh, once it was commissioned, by, or was it like a prize of war or something like that? Basically, it wound up Chinese, and so I figured, eh, I'll tell the story of the Yukikaze. Just give me just a second to uh, get the proper page. But this is one of those insane ships where it's like, uh, how is this real life? Or And how is there not a movie on this already? Uh, but anyways, here's the story. Just quote, the legend of the Yukikaze. Disclosure. While the writer has done her best to... I'm, I'm not the writer, obviously. Done her best to double-check the validity of her sources, the post below should be taken with a large grain of salt, as it is primarily meant for a bit of humor as well as highlighting one of the most interesting ships of the... Imperial Japanese Navy's arsenal. Uh, people did excellent job with the profiling, and this person is simply seeking a series of rather improbable coincidences that happened along their, her career. All right. Anyways, known as the, known in the Imperial Japanese Navy as the Destroyer of Miracles, the Kagero class destroyers were some of the best destroyers at the time. Though I don't really think the IJN knows what they were getting themselves into when Yukikaze was born in 1940. For her status as the lucky ship of the IJN came... Er, sorry. For her, status as the lucky ship of the IJN came at a terrible cost of taking away all luck from her allies. Let's take a look. November 42. The legend of trolling begins. In the first naval battle of the Guadalcanal, Yukikaze was assigned to battle alongside the battleships Hei and Kirishima as part of a supply mission. It was probably one of the most confused naval experiences of the Pacific War. The IJN lost Hei after sustaining repairable damage. Uh, Yukikaze, escorting her on her first combat mission, had the good fortune of picking up her crew members. Yukikaze was unharmed during this battle. November 42 to February 43. The Tokyo Express was having problems supplying the front... Uh, Imperial Japanese Army lines at the Guadalcanal. In a series of supporting maneuvers, Yukikaze escorted the Hiyo and Zuiho. Yukikaze was unharmed, despite the numerous losses to both supply and manpower during the Tokyo Express. March 43. The Battle of the Bismarck Sea. In a disastrous defeat for the IJN, four out of eight destroyers and all eight of, out of the eight transports were lost as a result of Allied air attacks, losing nearly 3,000 men in this battle. Yukikaze was unharmed. As a matter of fact, she successfully delivered her reinforcements and also picked up many unfortunate sailors along the way. July 43, Battle of... Oh, and now the names get interesting. Uh, Battle of... Columbangara. Uh, Yukikaze, thanks to her new radars, was the first to spot the USN fleet in the engagement. In this unfortunate battle, the flagship of the IJN task force, Jinsu, was lost. While it is true that Jinsu drew enemy fire through the liberal usage of her searchlights, the fatal blow came from a torpedo hit in her engine room. That torpedo, insofar as after-action reports were capable of piec piecing things together, was actually aimed at the Yukikaze. However, due to a stroke of fortune, it went under the Yukikaze's hull because it was set too deeply. Yukikaze was unharm unharmed in this battle, and after picking up fallen personnel from the Jinsu, she successfully landed 1,200 troops afterward. That was July, now June 44, uh, a year later. Sorry. The Battle of the Philippine Sea. Yukikaze, in another stroke of good fortune, managed to avoid this battle due to engine troubles. She was sent to escort an oil tanker instead, which was promptly sunk by a U.S. submarine. As expected, Yukikaze was unharmed and picked up the fallen sailors. For a second to scroll down. Alright, because I'm reading it browser and whenever I mouse out it moves sound. Anyways, October 20th, 44, the Battle of Late Gulf. The Trolls, the Trolls Coteers of the IJN unite, and their mere presence is correlated with the sinking or critically damaging of the battleships Musashi, Yamashiro, and Fuso. The aviation battleships Issei and Hyuga, uh, the heavy cruisers Adako and Maya, the light cruisers Mogami, the carriers Chiyoda, Zuikaku, 
Zuiho, and Chitose, and a lot of other smaller vessels. Yukikaze was unharmed during this engagement. What's coming up next? Yep, she saved a bunch of fallen sailors. Woo! Uh, let's see, that was October 20th, then November 44. Uh, Yukikaze. Nice kill. Yukikaze escorts the battleship Kondo along with Urakaze, another Iron destroyer. An attack from the submarines USS Sea Lion and sank the Congo with two torpedoes. Third sank Urikaze, who was lost with all hands. As expected, Yukikaze was unharmed. Now, you'd think at this point the IJN will, might be noticing a pattern here. After all, by now she's pretty infamous for her absurd ability to curse everything that's sorting alongside her. Nope, some people are just willing to test their luck. November 29th, 44. The greatest of IJN carriers, Shinano, was launched and escorted by Yukikaze. You know where this story's going. Within 20 hours, the Shinano was sunk by the USS Archerfish. Yukikaze was unharmed. Uh, when asked by a mildly irritated Shinano pilot about how they managed to get to them so fast, the captain of the Yukikaze... Oh man, um... Tarachi... Tarachi? Sato, I'll put it on screen probably so that you bully me how I pronounced it, simply remarked, it's what we do best at this point. Really, we've spent more time picking up our guys than actually shooting at the enemy. And December 44 to April 45, the U.S. engaged engages in massive aerial strikes against the Imperial Japanese Navy and Imperial Japanese Army holding. The Yukikaze was unharmed, despite having fired tens of thousands of rounds at incoming U.S. air assets. April 7, 45. Operation Tengo. Oh my. As, as Yamato's escort, Yukikaze was engaged as direct support for the symbol of the Imperial Japanese Naval Powers. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest, given the Yukikaze's track record so far, I doubt that Yamato's captain would have had any hope in terms of coming back alive. Or hotel. As expected in this suicide attack, Yamato's task force lost four of her eight destroyer escorts, with one heavily damaged. Uh, oh yeah, I got stuck on the line here, I wasn't paying attention, or, no, I lost my steering, never mind, that was it. Uh, sorry, lost my place. Oh yeah, lost four out of her eight destroyer escorts with one heavily damaged, her only light cruiser, and numerous aircraft. Yamato herself fell to U.S. aerial bombardment in this engagement. Yukikaze was unharmed. Again, scrolling down. And actually, uh, when they retreated back to... Uh, all these fun names. Sasebo Naval Base, they found a bomb in the Yukikaze supply slash ammo room. The bomb was a dud. It had gone clean through the top deck, but for some reason didn't explode. So the hapless sailors found out that its fuses did in fact work when they accidentally set off an explosion with it after it had been transported off the Yukikaze. So it was a dud, moved out of range of the Yukikaze, kaboom. Woo. Uh, after Operation Ten Go, the IJN was basically annihilated. <clears throat> Chief Yukikaze fled from port to port, and an estimated 15,000 planes, by Imperial Japanese Navy estimates, over several dozen sorties, attacked her to no avail. She was only successfully bombed once, but that bomb struck her was another dud. Her immunity to explosives seemed to carry through to mines as well. In a desperate bid to escape the U.S. air attacks at uh, Miyazu Bay, Yukikaze and Hatsushimo, a fellow destroyer, fled through one of her their own minefields during the confusion. Yukikaze accidentally hit a mine. Bet you can guess what I'm gonna say. And the mine was also a dud! Yukikaze was unharmed! A few minutes later, Hatsushimo hit a mine too! Boys and girls at home, do we want to guess what happened? This one wasn't a dud, and she sank within five minutes. So, yeah. Lucky as all get out, at the cost of everyone else. Uh, at the beginning of the Pacific Theater, the Imperial Japanese Navy had 82 destroyers. At the end, Yukikaze was one of the handful left. With a cruising distance of 124,800 kilometers, she participated in almost all of the major battles of the Pacific Theater. Yet, Yukikaze was more or less unharmed. The few times she was hit, she was not hit in any critical location. And all four of her captains lived to a ripe old age and died peacefully. And she lost less than ten crew members throughout the entire war. Ah, uh, which of course, no wonder there was a saying in the Imperial Japanese Navy. If you served on the Yukikaze and died, it was thanks to your own bad luck. Karma. Um, 
Yet the trolling legend of the Yukikaze does not end here. And this is me. It's insane. I love this story so much. But, uh, anyways. Yuki a legend does not end here. Yukikaze, now the Dan Yang, uh, was part of the Republic of China's newly formed navy. On the day when she was newly christened, July 6th, 1947, General Deng Long of the People's Liberation Army broke past the Yellow River defense line in one of the most memorable military operations in the Chinese Civil War. This operation was known as the Night of the Long Sword, where millions of PLA Army elements infiltrated and launched a surprise attack on heavily entrenched ROC position. In what would be seen as the beginning of... Ooh, that was close. Or no, I... Sorry, the torps launched. I had, I had seen the ally, but dumb. Um, anyways. In what was seen as the beginning of the total collapse of the technologically, numerically, and theoretically superior Republic of China's army, Yukikaze, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Dan Yang, was prepared, was preparing to sortie out in order to provide support to the ROC ground force. Uh, hang on just a second, scrolling down. But that's just a coincidence, shoot me dead. She wasn't even at the battle. You're right. She had some problems and needed to be repaired. The next time she would be ready for battle was late February of 49, so basically two years later, I think, or so. Yeah, July 47 to, yeah, that would be about two years. And by then, it was too late for the ROC to take control of mainland China. February 25th, 49. Yukikaze so sorties out of port for the first time in a long, long time. On that same day, the largest ROCN ship and her flagship, the Chongqing, which is a, an ex Royal Navy, or sorry, no, Russian Navy, the Aurora. Thing. That's the Aurora. Uh, defects to the PLA. Kikaze remains unharmed, of course, and in the next 20 years, she stayed relatively low key. Good thing, too, because the ROC basically got the rear handed to them throughout this process. Okay, November 16th, 66. Last thing was 49, now 66. The Dan Yang is ordered to retire. December 26th, 66. On the day of her reassignment as a target and practice ship, the PLA's first mid-range missile test was successful. Four days later, the PLA exploded their first hydrogen bomb. Ah. Uh, maybe the ROCN finally figured out that Yukikaze was cursed. By now, she was an old, old ship who really should have reached her natural lifespan decades ago. So on December 8th, 71, the day Yukikaze was ordered to be scrapped, the United Nations formally recognized the PLA-led Communist China as the proper representative of China, kicking out Taiwan, the ROC, in the process. Uh, let's see, that was December 8th, 71, 70, February 21st, 72, the day in which her scrapping began. Nixon visited China. On the same day, Supreme ROC leader... Oh, man. Uh, Chang... Kai Shek, who renamed Yukikaze and ordered her scrapping, was hit by a bus as he was trying to get to his office. Karma. Um, this car accident resulted in a series of health complications, culminating in his death a mere three years later. Uh, Yukikaze's ship, ship bell, clock, anchor, and propellers are currently on museum display in both Taiwan and Japan for those interested should you decide to visit. However, I'd suggest bringing as many good luck charms as you can realistically get through customs. Smile face. Um, in a final gesture of goodwill, Yukikaze's artifacts were returned to Japan in 91. And yeah. A month later, or a month after she was enshrined in the museum, uh, Etajima Museum of Military History, formerly the Imperial Japanese Navy Academy, Japan suffered one of the worst economic crashes in its history. Uh, if you want to look that up, you can wiki Japanese asset price bubble crash. Uh, let me scroll down. Oh, that was it, basically. And so our tale of Yukikaze comes to an end. I would comment on more recent situations, but the mu re museum curator who I contacted was fired a month after assisting me in compiling this information. So unfortunately, he's not going to be able to help us anymore. Thank you for reading, and may the Yukikaze ever be with you. So yeah, that was this person's story, and just... It's insane the amount of incidents, I guess you would say, uh, happened with the Yukikaze. You know, I mean, just... <laughs> bombs hit, duds. Hits mines, duds. And even then, the bombs were removed and then exploded. Um, 
you know, the day that her scrapping was ordered, or uh, going to be happening, the guy who ordered it ends up getting hit by a car. And I, I mean, he died three years later, but you know, just like, good god, ow. Let me scroll down to see if anything was added. I don't think there was anything else, but I think just, you know, an insane, insane story, in my opinion. Yeah. This. And this is the ship that's coming to worship. No, uh, should be interesting. I think I'll end it here. I don't think I really did anything else other than just, you know, finish capping the base. I think I ended with the four kills. If I didn't, then I'll probably just add on the rest of the match to silent without commentary or, you know, modify the video. But anyways, that's the story of the Yukikaze, and she is, or Dan Yang, I guess, is how they're going to be. How they're going to be bringing it. Tan Yang, my bad. Um... Let's see, some more stuff from the tech tree, though. Or, the interview, I'm sorry. The Wargaming hopes to release the Pan-Asia tech tree this year, and they planned it to release that second ship, the Tanyang, this January, but the ship got delayed for adjustment. Uh, someone does ask about the problem of the Pan-Asia tech tree being too many con concentrated destroyers and only a couple cruisers, and the... Publishing producer Hisashi Yaganuma's reply was, if they can't find out more historical ships on document, then these new ships will get their chance in-game. But, uh, yeah, that's all. Do you have an interesting naval story? Uh, do you have any thoughts, comments, you know, about about the Yukikaze? Did you enjoy the story? Feel free to leave that in the comments area. And, uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.